Hello and welcome to the Unsung Sport podcast, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the sports you love. Today I'm joined by Ryan Baldy, football writer and author of books such as The Next Big Thing, The Dream Factory, They Always Score and Arson Who. Uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Um, well, Ryan, I know we've, we've had a, a brief exchange earlier today and, and we were talking about your your first book, which was The Next Big Thing, uh, where you interviewed, I think it was 15 Wonder Kids, is that right? That's right, yeah, 15. 15. Um, and I, I was brought up playing championship manager, uh, so those players such as John Bostock and the legendary Cherno Samba, the uh, the Millwall youth player that scored, I think, 132 games uh, goals in 32 games at youth level. Um what was your inspiration for the book? Were you were you a big championship manager player? I was, yeah. Um, I remember the, the, I'm still nostalgic for the old versions of the game. Um, I think I remember playing it, going around my friend's house when I was sort of probably nine or ten, playing one of the very early versions in the mid '90s, um, and being hooked from then. Um, yeah, I don't play it so much these days. It got a bit too complicated for me, if I'm honest. Um, or the, the the later versions are just too time consuming. I liked it when you could kind of blast through a season. Uh, in a few hours at a time um, but yeah I used to love it so uh, that was probably um, without really realising it sort of subconsciously part of the motivation um, because you're always on the hunt for the next big thing in in championship manager and football manager um, but yeah in terms of where the, 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 the kind of the solid inspiration for the book came from um, I, I don't really have an answer for it I'm afraid um, I don't really know I think just kind of a long long time fascination with um, just that kind of moment where a young footballer breaks through um, they seem to have everything at their feet and then it can kind of go one of, one of two ways for them. Um, when it hits, there's nothing quite like it, I think, as, as a fan of a club, when a, particularly if it's an academy product, a local lad comes through and um, kind of you see them taking on all comers as a, teen, a fearless teenager. Um, I think there's nothing quite like it for fans. So kind of di- digging into the other side of that when, when things don't quite pan out was something I was, I was interested in doing. Yeah, I mean, we hear a lot of... Uh... I think every every club's had that that great hope, you know, the the likes of like Sonny Pike as, as an example is one I can remember as well. Like he's the mm. he's the next Diego Maradona, and like the kids sixteen, it, it's, it's so much pressure, isn't it, on on young kids? Yeah, for sure. Sonny was one um, I spoke about doing the book because I, I wanted to do it um, with players who um, were willing to speak and kind of really share their stories and their insight. Um, so everyone, uh, all the fifteen players featured were interviewed, and I spoke to teammates and coaches and, and different people I've worked with through the years to, to flesh out their stories. So Sonny was one I tried to get for the book. I had a list of maybe 40 or so um, that I drew from and worked my way through and tried to get a lot of the kind of bigger names that would be more familiar with with your listeners, uh, like Sonny Pike, like Freddie Adu, um, Ravel Morrison is someone I've, I've long been fascinated by Ravel. I've done a lot, quite a lot of um, uh, work on him, uh, features on him for magazines and things, but um, yeah, never wasn't able to bring it together to, to get any time with him for the book. So um, yeah, I went with the ones that I got. I think the players I got in the end were the ones who were perhaps um, had come to terms with, with everything they've been through a little bit better maybe than the ones who weren't quite ready yet to share their story. So um, I think that's what it came down to in the end. The, play, the players I spoke with were the ones who'd kind of um, been able to compartmentalize, not compartmentalize that period of their life and, and, and speak about it with with uh with, with candor um so yeah those are the ones who were uh who were in the book i mean it's interesting you say that because i think the uh there must be a lot of regret you know there's probably it, did they let themselves down did they let other people down what was the general theme of the, of the people that you spoke to it was just that they were, they were, it can happen in so many different ways i think my main realization was just how many um, pitfalls there are and how difficult it is. How the odds are against any player kind of making it, and certainly to the level uh, of the expectations that were thrust upon some of these players in the early in the early years of their career. There's so many hoops they've still got to jump through to to, to reach their potential. Um, there's so many pitfalls waiting them that a lot of them are out of their control. Some of them aren't. Um, so yeah, some of it comes down to decision making, influences, but some of it is just plain luck. Or, or timing is a big thing as well. Getting the wrong manager at the wrong time can really set you on a, on a different path. Um, if there's a player in your position who's established and you just can't get the minutes, so you need to develop at a certain age. It can be any number of things. That was kind of my main takeaway was that there's no real one factor you can point to. Um, it, it can it can come in many different forms. And and out of all of the players that you spoke to, whose story was the most shocking to you? Um, I think. Uh, 
to put it in terms of shocking, I think it would be Andy van der Meder because um, his story was one that was extracted the most in in promoting the book um, when it uh, was kind of offered for extracts to um, newspapers and, and, and websites and things. Uh, the van der Meder one was one that resonated most because it's a story of kind of sex, drugs and rock and roll in a lot of ways. Um, he uh, kind of went off the rails and struggled with addiction for, for many years. Um, but he was, he was an interesting one too because um, I named the chapter Chaos Theory uh, because <clears throat> um, I was basically looking at it in terms of it being kind of a butterfly effect um, of, of a small event that set him on a path to kind of self-destruction in many ways. So he was at Ajax as a kid, the, the club he grew up supporting and he came through the academy was one of their top players, won a title there at a young age. And then in his early 20s, they sold him um, to Inter in Italy. Um, and he was uh, not the kind of personality who was um, necessarily looking for that kind of that kind of big move. He was quite a homebody. He didn't really want to go anywhere. I think he was quite settled and happy with where he was in his life at that stage. But they sold him. Um, he, he came down to the pitch for training one day. And I think it was Ronald Koeman at the time. His manager said, oh, you need to go. You've been sold to Inter. You're off. Um for a lot of players, that might be a dream move, uh, a big opportunity at a point in his career where he was, he was really flying. He was already a, a full international for the Netherlands. But he went to Italy, and when he arrived there, um, the manager, I think it was Hector Cooper, the the, uh, the manager at the time, so when he went to his first training session, he went and introduced himself to the manager, and the manager basically said, who the fuck are you? Because uh, he was signed by the the sporting director or whoever it would have been who was in charge of transfers at the time at Inter. So he wasn't the manager's player. The manager had his own players. He had he had wingers who he wanted to use. He, I think he actually played a system that didn't have wingers, so there was no real place for him. He found himself on the sidelines in, in an unfamiliar country, missing his family. Um, and that's kind of where it, he started to sink into a bit of a depression and, and a dependence on, on drugs and alcohol and things. And the, the life that he, he ended up getting into, and there's so many different twists and turns and things like... Just little moments, like I said, the kind of butterfly effect of one small thing setting on on a path to uh, to, to destruction that he, he never, was never really able to, to come back from. Yeah, it's a tough one because everybody thinks that uh, football players are, uh, yeah, it's a dream job, isn't it? But at the end of the day, you're kind of a commodity, and you don't always, you know, you're not in control of your career path in a lot of ways, like uh, like you know, like you and I would be, really. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's a strange thing, isn't it, to think. There's a monetary value attached to you, um, and you're not necessarily the kind of master of your own uh, destiny. Um, like you said, there are people making big decisions about you, um, and you're a, a secondary consideration in all of that. Um, I guess players can always turn down a move, but again, I think he would have been earning more money for going to Inter, so there was that side of it too. He would have had an agent who would, would have been talking up the the virtues of going to Inter and, and taking that big signing on fee, which he would have been getting a cut off. Mm-hmm. So there are so many factors that go into it that um, even though you might kind of have a kind of a semblance of of self control, it's more of a facade, really. Yeah, and was there any one thing that was like really surprising um, from yourself interviewing those players? Uh, maybe the honesty. Uh, like I said, these were the players who were kind of ready to share their story. Some of it was quite hard uh, for them to speak about at times. Um, some of it was quite hard hitting and talking about like dark times in their lives when they really struggled. Um, there was, you know, one of the players was talking about a time where he was um, loaned out to a lower league team. Uh, his prospects weren't great. He was falling out of the manager and he was really struggling away from home. Never been away before. He was in his late teens, I think, at the time and was struggling with gambling addiction. Um, it's just things like that. People... Uh, you know, young people who were going through a tough time and things that they kind of been promised weren't weren't delivered upon. Um, so that was kind of, yeah, the the kind of harder things to hear and to make sure, you know, they were trusting me with their stories. Um, so that I kind of have a responsibility to them to tell them in a balanced way and try and put across like like an empathy for them um, to make the reader understand that you know, like you said, these are young people um, in circumstances beyond their control a lot of the time. So. While it might, while they live in many people's dreams, you know, it's not always as um, as sweet as it, as it seems from the outside. Yeah, you're right. I think we do forget their their, their kids sometimes. I guess, um, what piece of advice do you think that a, a, any future wonder kid reading that book could take away? Um, I'm not sure to be honest with you because uh, I think every case is so different uh, and it's unique to the individual. I think if there's any advice, it's on on the people kind of handling them. Um, 
whether that's family and friends, whether that's agents and professionals in, in the management side, whether that's clubs and, and managers and coaches themselves, just to kind of guard them from that as much as possible. I know a lot, a lot of clubs and a lot of players, uh, sorry, a lot of managers do try to do that. I know it's hard when the kind of whirlwind of expectation builds and there's a media maelstrom around these players because it is such an enticing subject when, when this young player comes through and, like I said, wants to take on the world and, and looks like they've got the, the whole world at their feet. Um, it's, it's a big story always, especially at the bigger clubs. Um, so it's hard to kind of really dampen that down and, and kind of manage expectations. But I guess that's as best as possible what, what needs to be done for these people. Yeah, it'd be funny. I was looking at a uh, an article actually just just earlier today around AC Milan of, of, of um, I've had a 15-year-old kid make his debut. He's, he took over from Wisdom Amy, I think, as the youngest Italian and uh, one of the one of the quotes in there was like this player scored over 400 youth goals in x amount of games how is that possible and like but that was taken into account training and five aside right like, like i mean it's just media just way over hyping so yeah, already yeah. this kid is just built up to be you know the, the next ronaldo and messi but it's it's such an unfair comparison mm, no for sure uh, there are so many you know players who who aren't? I think development isn't linear. There are players who are ahead of the curve at seventeen, but they might be closer to their full potential than somebody who's not going to peak until they're twenty four, twenty five, twenty six. Um, I think you know Cristiano Ronaldo is when you say today he's a, a kind of example of this. He was always a a bright prospect, but never to the level that he went on to achieve. You know that was kind of realised sort of early early to mid mid twenties when he came back from two thousand six World Cup and he really started to put it all together at twenty two, twenty three years of age, that's when you really start to think, okay, this guy could be one of the best two or three players in the world. Whereas before he was kind of seen as a fancy down and written off and not really uh you know perceived to have not been developing his uh, his delivery and things like that. So yeah, it's 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 not a linear thing. Just because somebody stands out at fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, sometimes that can be because they're really physical developers as well. So they're kind of ahead of the curve in that respect and they're essentially in a man's body playing against boys but there will be a point at which players catch up to them um, and then it comes down to their technical ability and their, their um, mental ability as well and, and, and different aspects of, of what, what goes into making a player so there's so many factors that I think we don't really always fully consider and obviously you moved on from the wonder uh, the wonder kids side into uh, the, the the world of academy football as well uh, with your next book which was uh, Dream Factory can you give us an overview of that yeah, so um, they're kind of connected, I guess, in a way. Um, it wasn't uh, an express uh, idea, an express kind of um, goal of mine to go from, to stay within the world of youth football, but um, I think I developed some contacts within that, that world um, in, in doing the first book and, and, and some of the work I did, um, freelancing for doing profiles of young footballers where I'd go and speak to their coaches from, from their youth teams at various clubs and I developed a good amount of contacts within the youth football game, so I just wondered whether it might be possible to go and kind of behind the scenes, going have a peek behind the curtain. Because from my perspective, back back when I started working on this book, which would have been about twenty eighteen, I guess it would have been. I think it came out in twenty twenty one. It was you know, maybe twenty nineteen. It's about two years in the making. Um, I wanted to see, you know, the the academy world to me at that at that time was kind of a closed off environment. You didn't know too much about it you kind of knew roughly who had a good academy based on who was producing players either for sale or for their first team but we knew a lot less about what what goes into that on a day-to-day basis and what what's happening in these training grounds and what's going on on the on the grass essentially and um, so I wanted to see if I could kind of infiltrate that world and I wasn't sure it was going to be possible um, but I went to work kind of messaging people and seeing if I could get get some time with with academy managers with with coaches with with players and parents and all these different people and um, yeah, I found um, that the people doing the actual work, the day-to-day, the, I like to say the people who, whose, whose toes touch the turf, the coaches who are doing the work on, on the training pitch, were really keen to share what they're doing. They're really proud of their work, um, as well as they should be. Um, and they were quite willing to kind of open the doors and, and, and embrace me investigating this world and, and kind of shining a light on it for, for better or worse at all the different aspects and showing that, because I think um, the way uh, academy football in particular is covered it's often from a, a very negative bent or it's from a very kind of clip control PR bent where it's very positive. So the truth is always somewhere in the middle. So I was kind of trying to get in there to see what, what, what it was really like. And I managed to, I think Crystal Palace, well, I don't think I know, Crystal Palace was the first team I went to visit. Um, it was it was a February of, I guess, 2019, yeah. 
it was just before my first book came out, I started working on it, it was February 2019, it was an unseasonably warm day it was really weird it was like 25 degrees beautiful sunshine i remember being out on the turf watching their under 18s train um watching their coach put on a session um and i've been fully embraced by the academy manager we said go and do what you want go and watch whatever you want so i stood with my notepad at the side of the pitch and, was, and i remember at that point thinking okay i'm in this is possible now because um, i always say um access begets access because once you get in in one place you can use that as an example and take it somewhere else when you're asking for access elsewhere and, and it kind of just starts a, a snowball effect rolling where you can kind of keep that momentum going and, 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 and take that to other clubs so yeah I, I spent a couple of years going all, all up and down the country at various levels I wanted to to not just do you know the odd Premier League club or look at the best academies I wanted to go down and see how um, places with, with less budget operate so I went to Bury just before they went under um as it happened, literally weeks before the club folded, um, I went and spent some time with their, at their academy, and that was really fascinating too, because they were um, situated at the time in Man City's old training ground. Um, Man City, once the money come in, had left to pastures new um, <coughs> in the east of Manchester with a beautiful facility, which is another one I went to visit for for the uh, for the book as well. In the end, I spoke to their under 18s manager at the time, who's now uh, Gareth Taylor, who's now their women's team manager. Um, but yeah, Barry, it, it was a fascinating contrast because I pulled onto the car park and you could still see on the facade of the building uh, the old uh, Man City crest where it had been taken down. Um, you could see it, it said you know, the Man City um, lettering on, on there. And it, it all kind of, the paint had faded behind where the, where the lettering was. It had never been given another lick of paint since they left. And Barry had put on their own lettering saying Barry Football Club, but the C and the B of club had fallen off. It was just a perfect encapsulation of the haves and the have-nots and going to spend the time with Mark Litherland, who was our academy manager at the time, and talking about how he deals with recruitment with a budget of £5,000 a year and how in the, in the catchment area that they, they cover, they have the likes of Man City and Man United to compete with all these Category 1 academies with much bigger budgets. So they have to think of different ways to kind of entice players and they were kind of a, a safety net almost for, for players who were let go by the bigger clubs. So come here and you'll get opportunities and they kind of... Um, made it a point of pride that they were bringing players through and also helping them in their careers and selling them on to, to bigger clubs and kind of kick-starting their careers in that way. So, yeah, it was, it was really interesting to go to a dozen or so, 12 or 15, I'm not sure how many it was in the end, clubs all at different levels, all up and down the country, and, and look at all the different ways they operate and all the different challenges they face and how they how they tackle them. Yeah, it's a surprise, actually, you mentioned that, because I think the amount of, obviously, those those Cat 1 academies from, from the, the Uniteds and Cities... If you're getting their cast offs, actually, that's, I don't mean that in any disrespect way, because the the amount that those those teams have, like it's it's near impossible to get through. We know what the stats are like, but there must be some great players that fell down there. So, yeah, it's a shame that um, Barry went under because you think they would have actually quite a good good flow of candidates coming through. Yeah, I think they did, and they did really well to kind of offer them a safe landing, a soft landing, somewhere where they, they would be nurtured and their development was really cared for. And like I said, the, the, there was a kind of a steady stream going back the way as well. So you, they, they had evidence of bringing players in and then selling them onto the championship or, or, or a lower Premier League team and, and showing them, you know, we, this is something we can we can offer you. This is something we do here. So yeah, it was it was definitely a fascinating way of, uh, uh, of attacking the problem that they faced. Yeah. Who had the best uh, academy that you visited? Um, so it was probably City. Um, I met with um, uh, Tony Whelan, who's the academy program advisor at Man United, but it was during COVID, so I couldn't actually go to Carrington and visit. But he's featured in the book heavily. Um, he's uh, he's in his early 70s now. He's, I'm still in, in, in close touch with him. Um, he's just one of the most kind of sage and wisest guys in the game. He's, he's coached at, at the club for 30 plus years. We've seen everyone come and go. And he's got such a, a fascinating perspective and a real kind of grounded perspective on it all. Um, so he was great, but I, I didn't get to go behind the scenes at United. Um, so yeah, City, in terms of the ones I actually went and visited the facility, I would say it was probably City, real state-of-the-art stuff with their own purpose-built stadium. Um, I went to watch the FA, FA Cup final as well that they were in, playing on home soil against Liverpool. Uh, but Liverpool was another one I went to. Um, looked at the Women's Academy side on that, on that part. That was really interesting. Um, they had a really nice facility too. Um, Chelsea was one I didn't get into, but I spoke to a lot of people from, and of course they have a, a great reputation for developing players. But um, yeah, I spoke to some parent, like I spoke to Mason Mount's dad, I spoke to Rian Brewster's dad, um, 
and that was a kind of fascinating way of looking at a different a different angle on it all as well. So yeah, there were some there were some big names in there for sure. Uh, yeah, I would say City were the one in terms of most impressive facility for sure. That's fair enough. And you mentioned there obviously the parents and like we know the time commitment for the for the players is massive, but also you know that you need that time commitment from the parents as well. Um, what was what was the reception like from the parents? And did you speak to the parents of you, you mentioned Mason Mount and Ryan Bruce, though obviously players that made it. But did you speak to any of those parents of children that were let go? Yeah, that was a big part of the book. So there's, there's a, there are a couple of sections that deal with like what happens when a, when a player is let go, what is there for them, what isn't there for them, what needs to be there for them, um, and, and the parents were a big a uh, big part of that. So I spoke to parents of uh, boys who had been let go from academies. Um, just to chart their journey and, what, and see what kind of support net was there for them and what they what they felt was missing essentially and how um, how their, their their kids have been disregarded in some ways. Um, so there's uh, a kid who was let go. Um, I think first by Liverpool and then by I think it was Oldham perhaps or something. It's someone from that kind of Greater Manchester area, and and he was I think maybe. 11 or 12 by the time he'd gone through this like double release and his mum was talking about the kind of shame that he felt because going back to school after being released from an academy where at school he'd be known as, as the footballer this guy who's you know he's going to go and be a Premier League star to kind of have to face his friends and not have that identity anymore have that have his identity essentially stripped away from him and not really knowing not having the tools emotionally to, to cope with that and she talked about how her son broke down and said, oh, I don't want to live anymore, you know, if, if I can't play football for this team. And she was trying to work towards um, designing her own programme and trying to get funding for it to help fill in the gaps in the aftercare. Um, that was something that was, yeah, that was um, really interesting to learn about, to see her own kind of ideas towards, you know, what, what should be done uh, within the game and what what isn't being done currently. There was a boy, uh, I spoke to the father of a boy of a seven-year-old who was let go uh, after he broke his leg very unceremoniously. And he um, he very kindly kind of showed me the letter that he was sent um, by one of the Premier League clubs. He asked them for the club not to be named because he didn't want his son to be identified. So we, we changed the name of the son and the parent in the piece. But he was, uh, uh, from the ages of four to seven, had been training with four uh, Premier League clubs within London. And, um, yeah, one of them he'd been with since he was four. Then he broke his leg playing for one of them. And I think all but one let him go within weeks of him recovering. And, uh, yeah, I was, so I was able to reproduce in the book the exact email that um, his father had been sent uh, releasing their son, uh, kind of disinviting him to, to come back to the academy. And it was just so impersonal. Um, it was one of those kind of boilerplate letters where, it says, Dear Parent Guardian, you're supposed to delete that bit and then fill the actual name of the person you're addressing, but they never bothered to do that. Never mentioned the kid by name. Uh, it said, you know, we, we don't have an evaluation. We can't give you an exact reason why, but here are three or four things that players of this age can generally improve, improve on if he wants to go away and work on it. And he was saying, this doesn't relate to my kid. My kid those are my kid's strengths. So that's the only needs to go and improve on this. Is not, this is completely impersonal. There's some, he's been with them for half of his little life and they're letting him go after he's gone through his trauma and, and the work to get back after breaking his leg, playing playing football, doing what he loved, and now they've very unceremoniously dumped him. So, yeah, that was another um, part of the whole kind of aftercare and, and what comes next uh, after release element of the book that the parents really helped with. That's, that's crazy. I mean, just the, just the fact that someone's training from four to seven is, I think, is crazy. I mean, I mean that age is, yeah, yeah, it blows your mind. But also, I think that it it probably shows just the volume and and the replaceability. There's so many um, kids that, that they can sign in. That is interesting, interesting you mentioned that, actually. Um, when I spoke to Rian Brewster, so Rian Brewster, I think he's at Sheffield United now, was at Liverpool, was one of their kind of big prospects at Liverpool. He was at Chelsea up until he was 14. Um, and I spoke to his dad um, about the point at which he joined Chelsea, so they scouted him at seven. His dad didn't want, really want him to go. They, they spotted him. I spoke to the scout who spotted him at this youth tournament. It was, it was one of the first ever times he played on grass, I think, and they spotted him and invited him to the academy, convinced him to come, and they, they run what are called satellite centres. So you have your main academy at Cobham, uh, which is also where the, the first team plays, uh, trains, rather, and they have satellite centres all around London to kind of extend their catchment area because up until the age of 14, you can only recruit um, players who live within an hour and a half's drive of your of your academy but if you spread out little academies all over the place you get to extend that net even further so they have they have 11 
uh, satellite centers. He was invited to one of the satellite centers um, and then very quickly then invited to the main academy to train with the very best prospects and Rian Bruce's daddy and um, was telling me about how he got talking to one of the coaches at the at the main center um, and he, he talked about how at any one point they could, they could cycle through 450 boys up to 450 boys per season just to find a couple who will go on to the, the main academy the rest are kind of here one week on the next and Ian, uh, Rian Brewster's dad talked about how you, you know, you'd see a set of parents one week, you know, get chatting with them, get friendly with them, then all of a sudden the next week they're not there again because their kid has been, you know, he hasn't made the cut essentially. And that's all pre-academy, that's eight, ages seven. So you can't, you can't sign for an academy until the under nines level. You can't sign forms, like you can't be exclusive to an academy until the under nines level, but they have pre-academies that some of them run for as young as sort of four and five years old, which is just, just wild, um, yeah. Yeah, we we I interviewed um, uh, the Arsenal's pre academy lead actually fairly recently, and he was he was telling us about the kind of satellite offices and working with Per Mertesacker, and and, and, and yeah, it is, it is a volume game, and 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 how even those kids as well, and the parents do take them. I think you mentioned this earlier, take them to multiple clubs, so it's not mm. just you know training with Arsenal twice a week, then it's Tottenham twice a week, and West Ham, and and uh, again. And there's a time commitment, and and I guess there's a balance there of pushy parents. So that that, that there's that element. Did you see? Look, like we're all proud of our kids if they have a great game in that. But do you see an element of of parents trying to push more than the kid wants it as well? Yeah, so I think it definitely happens. I was kind of told more anecdotally that I, w- I don't think the parents who do that kind of thing would ever admit to it or, or, or want to speak to it. But it definitely happens. Um, one thing I did um, discover, which was a bit of a shock to me as well was how parents become targets as well for, for agents. So uh, uh, Mason Mount's dad told me a story about how when Mason at one time was playing um, youth international football for England in France, I don't remember exactly what age he was at the time, but it was before, you're not allowed to sign with an agent until you're 18, or you can sign from 16 with parents' permission, so I guess he would have been around 16. And um, Tony Mount and, and, and his wife were at the bar in France and an agent sidled up to him and essentially offered him £200,000 if he would get Mason to sign with his agency. And Tony Mount is, is you know, he's, he's quite a well-off man. He's got his own business. He's, he's, he doesn't, uh, he didn't want for money at that time for sure. He was doing quite well, you know, um, upper middle class kind of guy. Um, but it's easy to see how parents from different circumstances might be swayed by something like that or with, you know, for, for, if it's a club offering offering a job for the parent, for example, to try and get their their kid through the door, some kind of incentive like that. Uh, Ian Brewster told me about that too. He said that when um, Rian came to the age of fourteen, um, when his uh, one phase of his, his developmental contract with with Chelsea was coming to an end, and he had the option to speak to other clubs, he eventually chose Liverpool. He told me how they went to see two or three others, and um, he was kind of targeted. You know, somebody came and put an arm around him and said, "You know, if your club's your boy signs with us, this is the life you'll be living." As they kind of stroll through the the players' lounge with him and things like that. So yeah, it was, it was it, that was one of the more shocking elements that I learned of how parents can be targeted as well. And it is easy to see how, like I said, if if parents who come, who come from kind of more meagre means than, than some of the ones who I spoke to might might find themselves more influenced by that kind of thing. The money in the game now that that's uh, yeah, you can see how that happens quite easily. I do remember, I think, again, I'm not sure when this was, it's going back because uh, Simon Bywater um, was, was quite vocal. Obviously, Stephen Bywater was a uh, youth goalkeeper at West Ham. So um, he wrote years ago about how academies just offered f- false promises um, just to keep players at the club with no real desire for them to, to kind of break through. Um, because, again, I guess as they get older, they become more of a saleable asset. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of West Ham's transfer dealings or academy um but you know is that something that uh, again did you, did you come across anything like that in the in the book not specifically there were a couple of things kind of tangentially related to that that come to mind there was one i learned of a coach um telling a group of seven-year-olds um i think i named the club in the book it was chelsea but i think i was told the story of uh, of, a, of, of a coach or a scout I'm not sure exactly. It was a while ago now. It's all in the book. The specifics are in the book, I promise you. It's not it's that wishy-washy. It's just it's a long time since I wrote it. But um, standing on the sideline of, of an under-7s game saying, 
you know, this this is that we we are the best developers of talent. If you sign for this club, there's a fifty percent chance you're going to go and play for our first team. And if you don't make it to our first team, you're going to go and have a career in the game because that's it. And it's just it was a nonsense number pulled out of the air and a completely false promise to to put onto a, a kid so young who's going to believe it. You know, they're, they're already wearing a tracksuit with a club crest on it. They already feel part of a Premier League club, and if they feel like they're on a path to something, you're just confirming that for them. When we all know anyone who's had a cursory Google search of, of, of the numbers behind how many players make it from under nines to a first team at any club, it's more like half of a percent rather than half of a whole intake. So, yeah, that was one thing I heard. And um, the other one um, is just the kind of necessity of, of having players in the academy for long periods when they might not have any prospect at all of making the first team, but you need numbers around to be able to develop and nourish the ones who do. There might be one or two in every age group who've got a genuine chance of developing into a first team star or a really big saleable asset. You can't develop them unless they have teammates. So you've got to keep the others around as quote unquote bodies, which is a really unsavory term that, that is used to describe the players who are on the books of a club who can be there for like, they could be 18 they could have been there since they were nine um but they were never really going to make it and then once they let go another thing that i talked about with players and let go is at, at the higher age groups is um how difficult it can be to then come and find your feet again within the game because you, you go on a process of trials a club might help you secure a trial or two elsewhere um where you can go and try out another club but once you, you know you're not in, a, in the best frame of mind, sometimes you're not even in the best physical shape. You haven't, you haven't been playing that much for for your previous team. That's why you were let go. So you don't show your best self. Then you get that rejection from the club who were kind of one level below the one you just left. So you go down a level again, and again it all just compounds. You can find yourself very quickly having five or six unsuccessful trials and trying to scrap around a, a non-league clubs to just find a you know, keep a toehold in the game, or you can go to one of these. Um, these, um, I forgot the exact name for them now, but the uh, EFL and the Premier League both run like trial days for, for release players where 100 or more players will turn up on one day and play half an hour, 11 aside in front of an assembly of scouts, essentially at a small non-league ground um, somewhere in the country, or at Loughborough, Loughborough University as well, they did it a lot of the times. And again, that's a kind of real meat market of of these players who've been rejected once were kind of scrapping to, to, to stay alive in the game. I spoke to Marvin Sordell, who, who went on one of these, about how difficult that can be and, and how many agents who aren't supposed to be there press their cards into the palms of parents who are stood on, on, the, on the sidelines. So, yeah, was, there's a whole kind of system around um, what goes on when, when a player's let go by a club. It's a very brutal and... Uh, um... Yeah, it's a brutal world of football at times. So, um, yeah, we get that. Um, stepping away from the uh, youth side of that, you then, um, your third book was around Manchester United's treble winning side. I, I forgot to ask, actually, are you a Manchester United fan? Who do you support? I don't support anyone, not anymore, anyway. Um, I've been doing this job so long that I've been professionally neutral that it's kind of just who I am now. I don't, I don't care who wins or loses on a weekend. I did grow up a United fan as a kid, but it's I don't care who wins or loses on a Saturday anymore. I'm a big fan um, of the teams I care about are in the American sports. So Boston Celtics, New York Giants, Boston Red Sox, um, Boston Bruins. So the, are those are the teams I care about. Whether they win or lose, they get emotionally invested in. But the ones that in football and, and what is more my bread and butter, I do cover the American sports as well um, in my work life. But football is the, the majority of what I do. And yeah, I've been neutral in that for so long that I really have no root and interest anymore. Fair enough. Probably, probably a good thing if you're a Man- were a Manchester United fan at the moment, anyway. But um, so, what insights did you uncover whilst researching this book? Oh, loads. I, I, I must have interviewed over two hundred people for this, um, and that was kind of the biggest task um, when I, when I set about writing this book. It's a story that's quite well known, so I had to bring something fresh to it. So I spoke to as many of the of the of the players and from the first team as I could, and the coaching staff, and got as many of the bigger names as I could. So I spoke to. You know, Dwight York did my foreword for the book and Nicky Butt wrote an afterword for it, which was great. And they were interviewed throughout the book. I went and met the app stand and interviewed him. Teddy Sheringham was really good. Um, but people like Ronnie Arnson and Henningberg were, were great. Jesper Blomqvist was great. Um, Steve McLaren, who was the assistant manager. But then it was people like Albert Morgan, the kit man, who I got lots of time with. It was great. It had lots of stories for me. The physio, Dave Fever, was incredible. I got so much insight and detail from him. Because um, a big part of the, that, the story that year was 
um, Roy Keane's recovery from from ACL, I an mean, ACL tear. So um, I, I got all the the rich detail about that that process, and right from the moment that Keane tore his ACL, and it's one of my favourite bits of reporting that I've ever done. That I tell the story of of Keane sustaining his ACL injury. I open a chapter about Keane with it. Uh, so he's at Ellen Road. He injures his his, his ACL. Alfie Harlan standing over him, shouting at him. So the retribution comes three years later, where he takes a knee high and gets sent off. That's all a separate story. So then I follow them to a, a private hospital, a Booper hospital in Wally Range in Manchester, where a couple of hours after the final whistle, where he's waiting in, in the hospital room to see the consultant who's on his way, like a club club uh, club consultant who's going to come and take take a look at his knee. Um, and there's a TV on in the in the little private room that he's got. And he turns the TV off and he turns to Dave Fever, the physio, saying, right, what the fuck's going on with my knee? And Fever explains to him, well, we think you've torn your ACL. That's what it looks like. And Dave Fever came from a rugby league background. He worked for Wigan in rugby league, where ACLs were a lot more common. He was really kind of ahead of the game in terms of how to uh, rehab them. So he was, the, you know, he, he knew everything about it. He knew what it was and knew what it was going to be. They just were waiting on the scan to confirm it before they could set up. And, he, and Keane was like, right, let's get on with it then. But my favourite bit of reporting that I did was finding out what was on that TV when, when Keane switched it off. So I'm really big on trying to set these scenes and give as much detail as I can to kind of bring it to life for the reader to really put you there rather than tell you what happened, kind of show you and kind of drop you into a scene and make you feel a part of it. So I, I tried to find out what was on the TV. I, I asked Dave, do you remember what was on the on the TV when he, when he turned it off? And he said, I, he said, I think it was blankety blank. And I could have just taken that and said, right, it was blank to blank and put that in. Keane turned it off, blank to blank. I didn't want to hear Terry Rogan anymore or whatever. I could have put in that line. But then I, I went and checked. I went and searched the newspaper archives for TV listings of that day. And I knew roughly what time of day it was. It was early evening, a couple of hours after Final Whistle. And blank to blank wasn't on that day. And not only that, it wasn't on that year. It hadn't been brought back yet. I think it was the following year. So I thought, okay, it's not blank to blank. I looked through the TV listings and said, what could it have been? What sort of, if he thought it was blank to blank, it must be something in that kind of stratosphere and I looked and I, and I saw an ITV that Family Fortunes was on so I went back to Dave the physio and said I know this is a weird question I know it makes me weird for asking it could it have been Family Fortunes that was on TV and he said yeah that was it Family Fortunes that's what was on the TV so I managed to find out that Family Fortunes was on the little TV in the hospital room, room when Keane turned it off and also the names of the families who were competing that day uh, the treasures from Birmingham against um Another another family from from Bradford. I don't remember the exact, but it's in the book, and I was I was really happy to be able to find those those little details to kind of bring this story to life. And yeah, the book's littered with with things like that, little kind of Easter eggs that I spent way too much time researching and finding for the little line that it was. But it's the kind of thing that I, I get obsessed about. So yeah, that was a, another way of bringing it to life. But yeah, people like like the kit men, the physios, the club chaplain who was great, some great insight. You know, kind of confidant to a lot of the players. He he officiated Gary Neville's wedding and a few others. Some uh, players would come to him and ask them to do funerals for family members and things. He was a really trusted um, member of the, of the team there and speaking to him, speaking to the groundsmen because there were issues with the pitch that year. So I managed to track down the groundsmen and speak to him and what it was like dealing with Ferguson and his demands, but also how you know praise from Ferguson meant so much to everybody. So yeah, so many people around the club and, and opponents as well. That was another big aspect of it. So you hear a lot from the from the, the big players, the big names within that team about the trouble all of, every year that the anniversaries come around, especially this year when the 25th anniversary comes around, you'll hear all about it from, from the big name players, but you don't hear as much about what it was like to play against them when they were in, in their peak and in that moment. So speaking to all different opponents and, and having these little interlude chapters between the bigger chapters where it's a first person account from an opponent of what it was like to play in a specific match against this United team. So people like Lee Dixon talking about the FA Cup semi-final replay in 99 and, and what it was like, how grueling that game was, what a great match it was, but how glad he was that it was over when it finally finished and how him and Tony Adams went back in the change room and were like, right, we've got to do it, come on. And they went through and congratulated United. Uh, the United players went into their dressing room, the champagne corks were popping and said, well done, lads, go and win it. And he said, and we didn't mean an effing word of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, getting things like that and getting that, that, that reverse perspective and then, yeah, just trying to tell it in, in as deep and fresh and fascinating ways as, as, as I could. And, and did you speak to, just out of interest, did you speak to Paul McGuinness? As part of yeah, I spoke to Paul. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he yeah he came on uh, quite recently as well. He's he's really good. Like it was yeah, funny really talk- smart guy, isn't he? Yeah, just talking to him about like when his dad was manager and he used to just kick around with um, Bobby Moore and play with some players. And yeah. Bobby Moore, sorry, Bobby Charlton and, and players like that. You just like yeah, just a normal childhood, isn't it? It's yeah. So he told me things about like how David Beckham when he was just breaking into the first team. 
I just love the game so much that after, on, on an evening you'd come down and join in with the under fourteens and be pinging passes and they'll they'll all be in awe watching him like hitting a forty yard pass across a, an indoor gym and things like that. And Gary Neville would go and just do extra bits because that's how dedicated they were. So it was all such a good insight that you don't get unless you go and find the people and speak to them. Yeah, how different things are now from from that era. Um, so, um, I mean, how, how do you? Th- <laughs> Uh, this is a big. This is a big question. But how do you think Manchester United has changed since then? Just, just as a club, I think it's just decayed, hasn't it? If, if I'm honest, again, to bring it back to the book, one of the things I did for this, which I was really uh, privileged to be able to do, I went to the Cliff United's old training ground, um, and Tony Whelan, who I mentioned earlier, who works at the academy, he's been there for thirty odd years. Uh, him and Dave Bushell, who is uh, another academy program advisor, he was a player liaison. Uh, way back in the 90s for all the class of 92 and people like that. They, I went and met them uh, down the road from the cliff and they took me up there to go and see it and I thought, I'll go and have a look around, go and stand on the pitch maybe, that'd be amazing to just get the feel of the whole place. The building itself is closed. It, it was it's, it was condemned basically. It was, it was it was not safe to be in, but we managed to get in. We found a, there was a member of staff in there. They're not the door. They, they got me in through the back door and we went around and had a look and you know there's 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 rainwater coming in through, through the roof there's the the old change the first team change room had an inch of water across it it was just decrepit the, the, the old gymnasium was full of disused fitness equipment and old kind of promotional materials it just it was basically a, a, a giant cupboard for tat and uh, ferguson's office you know was was, was bare but there was a desk there and was, the, you could see the little shower room that he had off it where the, the bath was cracked the coach's room was all, all dusty, but yeah, this place has so much history. It was, it was like a living museum. You, you, you know, this is where Ferguson and his his cohorts plotted the treble. This is somewhere that goes back to the time of, of, of Busby and beyond. Uh, it's it's a living, breathing piece of Manchester United football history, um, and it was completely neglected. Um, I think for, I spoke to Tony recently. He said they are looking to do something with with that building now, but it just seemed like such an uncharacteristically missed financial opportunity if nothing else for, for United and, and the Glazers at the time to, to not kind of have walking tours like what I experienced is fans would would have loved to have done that too, you know, to go back and relive. Dave Bushell went to um we went into the lobby area. There was a little kind of waiting area at one side where, where journalists used to sit and wait for a line from Ferguson as he was coming and going to his car. Uh, and then there were stairs that take you upstairs, and underneath the stairs was the telephone. He said, "Oh, the phone's still here." And he told me about when David Beckham called him when he was on loan at Preston in 1995, and he was homesick and he was worried that Fergie didn't want him anymore. And he said, "I just want to come back. I don't want to stay here. He's going to sell me. He doesn't want me." Little did he know. Now, a few a few months later, he, he made his breakthrough and was off on on course to being one of the biggest superstars we've ever seen. But yeah, so many little insights like that from from having to walk around this place that has so much history, and it was just such a stark. Um, kind of encapsulation of, of where the club is now to see how it had been let to go to ruin essentially um, and I think probably similar parallels can be drawn with Old Trafford itself you see the leaks in the roof and it's a stadium that once was one of the best we had to offer in Britain it's still one of the biggest but I don't think it's one of the best anymore um, so yeah it needs a lot of work and it, I think that it's just they've kind of it's almost like you know when you see a, a building that hasn't been lived in for a long time and nature starts to reclaim that's almost what's happened with United at the moment they're kind of uh, gone a little bit wrong, but I think from what we gather from from uh, Sir Jim Radcliffe and, and Ineos and the people who are coming in now to, to run the show seem to have a, a decent idea about what needs to be done. So we'll see in the next in the coming months and years whether they can kind of right the ship. The Wembley of the North, as they say. That's the plan, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and your final book, uh, uh, I think it's your final book. Um, let me know if it isn't. Your final book is around Arsenal's uh, ninety. 90- 98 double winning side and most people would would maybe choose to write about the uh, the invincibles um why why did why did you go for the 98 it, it hadn't been done basically um so the invincibles has been done um you, you hear a lot more about the invincibles because they had that record of going unbeaten but um i've always been more fascinated by the 98 team because it was wenger's first title and i the story i cover isn't just their title year it's it's from the very moment Wenger takes over and all the changes he brings in up until the point they go and win the double in 98 um so it, it tells that whole story of how they found Wenger how they came to a point in where he came from who he is you know what what made him the coach he is today looking right back through his life and career and bringing it all together to tell the story of this team and this what, what was really interesting to me as well and always has been is how this Arsenal team 
um, kind of straddled two eras. So you had the old back five from the George Graham days where you had Keon Dixon, uh, Steve Ball, Tony Adams, Martin Nigel Winterburn, and David Seaman and Cole from the George Graham era where they were the bedrock of the success they had in, in the late 80s and early 90s. And then um, that was still in place when, when Wenger comes in. Um, then he kind of adds elements of flair to it as a free-flowing style of football on top of it and brings in players like Overmars and, and Vieira and Petit and Anelka. And of course, Ian Wright is still there and Burkamp was already there. So it's just coming together of two different phases of Arsenal Football Club um, to, to, to make one of the most formidable teams we've seen in the last 30 years or so in the Premier League. Yeah, it was quite a side. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you put it like that and just name those players, you know, even as somebody who doesn't support Arsenal, who, well, somebody who got spanked 6-0 by Arsenal uh, <laughs> the weekend, you have to say that that is a very impressive um, impressive team. Am I right in saying that uh, Wenger came from, was it Japan? Was he in Grand Pass 8 or something? That's right, yeah. So he, he was um, at Monaco before that. Um, I think eight years at Monaco, won the league and won the cup there. Probably would have won more, if not for Marseille's illicit uh, activities uh, involved in match fixing and things like that. Um, but yeah, he was essentially let go. He was, he was sacked um, quite unceremoniously, not so long after delivering like great success for that club. He, he was let go. Then he, he resurfaced in Japan with Grand Passate with the newly minted J-League. Uh, he uh, it, One of the interesting things I found out for this book, another of those little details that, that I really love, um, I spoke to Gary Lineker for it because he played for Grand Passate as well. And of course, they didn't. their times didn't overlap. Lineker left just as, as Wenger came. But Wenger moved into Lineker's old apartment and the correspondences between Wenger and Arsenal and David Dean back in Arsenal via fax when they're trying to hash out the, the, the finer details of his contract. He used Gary Lineker's old fax machine that was still in the apartment. So all the correspondence going to Arsenal had Gary Lineker's name on it which is a fascinating detail that I found out from from speaking to, to Gary Lineker for the book. So, yeah, that, that was really interesting. Yeah, Wenger, the whole Japan era is covered. His his early years and his, his playing days and his life growing up in in, um, in Alsace, which is um, near Strasbourg um, on the kind of German border. And that's why he's, he has kind of this Germanic name. He's fluent in German. A lot of his early football education came from going to watch teams in Germany, going across the border to see Werder Bremen and things like that. Um, yeah, right through to the point at which um, he's this this unknown. This, oh, that's where the Arsenal who comes from when when he's appointed at Arsenal. How they came close, sort of came close to appointing him a couple of years earlier, but they went for Bruce Riot because they weren't quite ready to appoint their first foreign coach just yet. Even though David Dean really went to bat for him, um, it, it begins with with the story of when David Dean first met him. As I interviewed Dean for the book, um, so that's all in there in great detail. And yeah, the whole kind of coming together of that early period, all the changes Wenger brought in with, with nutrition and diet and methods of training, but also some really great anecdotes around Wenger being quite a clumsy character. And there's some, some of the players telling me some hilarious stories. So there's a lot of humour in the book. Of course, there was so many. One of my favourite things to do for this book was I interviewed Ian Wright for it, but I asked everyone that I interviewed, what was your, what's your favourite writing story? And everybody had one from whether it was rollerblading around the marble arches, uh, over the marble hall, sorry, in uh, in Highbury, whether it was um, stealing the uh, uh, the team the team coach at the training ground and crashing it into a fence, so many different little writing anecdotes. Um, Lee Dixon told me one about how how uh, Wrighty wound up a a seventeen year old kid from a from a lower league team in an FA Cup fixture once, where he stood stood up opposite him and Tonon kind of sensed weakness and he looked at him, pulled up his shorts and showed him his thighs. Look at me. Now look at you. What are you going to do when you get out there? When, when I look like this and you look like that, and this kid cowered and Dixon said he was subbed off by half time. So many of these different stories, and I just kind of put them in uh, at the early part of the chapter about Ian Wright and then had Wrighty respond to them as well. So I said, I was told this story about you. What do you remember about that? And, you, he, and I'd have his response. It was so funny to kind of go through it all. But then also cover the kind of darker side of his personality as well because he's quite an emotional character. Uh, and this is a, a quite a difficult time for him because he kind of had to confront his football immortality because he was in his mid mid thirties at this stage, and uh, injuries were really starting to become a factor. As, as you know, he joined West Ham the next season, um, and then but Nelk would come through and they see him in training. So he, he knew that his time was short at Arsenal. So that was a really fascinating thing to talk to Ian about to, to think about how you know this was well established club legend saw his mortality in, from a footballing sense of point of view. And how he dealt with that, and then also you know, towards the end, we talk about how how he was told that they weren't you know, they were selling him essentially to West Ham. He was at the ninety eight World Cup doing some TV work, TV work, TV work. Um, and Wenger and Dean asked to meet with him in, in a hotel, and he walked into the room and he said it was like in that scene in Goodfellas where uh, he thinks he's going to get made where um, 
Joe Pesci's character thinks he's going to get made, become a made man, but he gets gets whacked. He said, that's what it was like. They went in, they told me, you know, you can stay if you want, but you're not going to play. We've got an offer from West Ham. It's a good one. We think you could take it. And in that moment, he was crushed because he knew you know, he was he was going to have to leave the club that he loved. He thought he would stay there to the end of his contract a couple of years later and then just retire. Um, so, yeah, it was really, really cool to kind of put together this whole different all these different aspects of, of Wright's personality and trying to bring them together so the humour but also the kind of the more difficult elements of his of his you know some, he was quite an ill disciplined player in that time as well so recounted all his FA charges was something I went through <laughs> in the book as well. Yeah there's, there's just so much there's so much to it. Even things like um we all know Wenger's success stories with the transfers and it all began in this era so bringing in Vieira before before Wenger was even confirmed as, as Arsenal manager he'd made them sign Patrick Vieira. So I went and told the story of how he how he found Vieira. It was when he went to visit um, George Weyer in, at AC Milan because he had Weyer at Monaco and Weyer was about to be presented with the Ballon d'Or. It was in the winter of 95. Uh, so he went across to uh, to, to AC Milan and, and uh, he was he was in the dressing room one time at half-time and saw this dejected, lanky Frenchman sitting on, on a bench and you know, he got talking to him and it, it was Patrick Vieira. He wasn't able to get a game at the time for for AC Milan, but he kind of remembered him and in, in, in knew him from France as well and, and what a talent he had been. I think it was in Nice where he started. Um, so he, when he were he he confirmed that he would take the Arsenal job, but he couldn't start until the first of October when his Grand Passate contract would would finish. He made them go and sign Remy Gard and Patrick Vieira before he came in, so he already had a couple of players through the door. So yeah, you know, we, we we saw all the successes he had with Petit and Overmars and everybody else after that. But I kind of went back and looked at some of the whiffs he had as well. So there's a player called Alberto Mendes who is probably known only to the kind of the hardest core of, of Arsenal supporters from back then, a German midfielder who Wenger plucked from like the fourth tier of German football at the time. He went and scouted him personally and, and signed him. Um, and I, yeah, I managed to hunt him down. He's coaching like a semi-pro level in Germany and I managed to get an interview with him and tell his story about you know why, why it didn't work out and what it was like being around the club at that era and what went wrong with him and what could have gone differently. Um, Alex Manninger was another great interview he was he was such a big part of that team but for such, such a brief period he had this like 13 game spell where he came in for David Seaman and David Seaman broke a finger but he, you know, he kept uh, he, he set a Premier League record for consecutive clean sheets kept a clean sheet at Old Trafford in the game that, that pretty much won them the title that March so I went and spoke to him and got his story which was which was incredible and even do you remember um, after that United game Old Trafford where Arsenal won one nil. Um, the cameras at the end cut to a guy in the crowd with, with curly black hair and a leather jacket on screaming into the camera going yes yes like really emotionally and they used it in their like promo for years and years this guy's name's Barry First um, and I managed to hunt him down and, and speak to him and he was he you know, he told me about how he was uh, he was working in a, in a, in a branch of a, of, a, of a bank at the time and how he was kind of had his five minutes of fame based off that because it was replayed so many times and how you know his his usual five minute walk to the tube took him 45 minutes the next day because people kept stopping him so you know trying to tell all, again trying to tell all angles of the story again and bringing in opponents as well speaking to people like Chris Sutton and I, I, there was a run uh, that Arsenal went on at the back end of that season where from um I think they won 10 games in a row up until the point they, they mathematically won the title with, with two games to spare by beating Everton. Uh, um, with every victory um, they had that, I spoke to an opponent and that's how I kind of told that that element of the story, that that section of, of the season was by doing it in the, in the first person words of an opponent and what it was like to play against this big, powerful, cultured team. And that was really, really interesting too. So yeah, again, just trying to tell all elements of the story because like you said, the, the Invincibles are, are the more famous team because of what they achieved, but I think this is a much more interesting team. And, and Lee Dixon did the foreword for this book and was interviewed again throughout it. And he, he said in, in the foreword, like, for my money, the Invincibles, the, the 2002 double team, if we if we all, we all played each other around Robin, the 98 team would, would win. We were the better team, the more complete team. We had the physical presence. We had the old English back four. We had these cultured uh, European players bringing in a new phase of football. We, we could kind of tick off all elements of the game we were the stronger side so yeah that was that was that was part of the fascination for me that's interesting always trying to see yeah to see if they could i know that the invincibles team had quite a lot of draws that's the one thing certainly man city fans would say that uh, they do have the, the the best points because they won more but uh, mm-hmm. that, that's a, a conversation for another day i guess mm-hmm. um i mean it sounds like you know obviously doing doing your research you have to speak to so many people is that is that the most challenging part of writing a book is just trying to as you say, tell everybody's story and get so many different viewpoints. 
Yeah, it's kind of the, probably the most fun part for me as well. Of just trying because when when you get one and you know you've got a little bit of little bit of gold that you can feed into it, it's such a thrill. So yeah, just going out and speaking to as many people as I can. It's a big, but you know, whenever I've been, I, I did a podcast recently where it was all about the process of, of writing books and kind of the, the work itself. And um, the host there, who was a publisher himself, asked, you know, what advice would you give? What tips would you give to a, to writers looking to write a book? And a mine is always to speak to as many people as you can. You've got to bring something fresh to a, a story that readers don't know or an angle they haven't seen before. And you only get that by speaking to people who are there and, and finding every, you know covering all your bases and speaking to as many people as you can. So I, like I said, I spoke to about two hundred people for the United Book, and it's probably about one hundred and fifty for the Arsenal one. And again, it's all the all the people you know, but it's also I think I spoke to three different kit men for this for this book, the two different physios. Uh, the people who run the travel department, or, or I spoke to as many people. You, I, I, they don't all get quoted in the book, but they're, they're, their insight is, is all invaluable to, to piecing it all together and providing this comprehensive view, but also being able to kind of put put together a narrative that is fresh and entertaining and hopefully gripping as well without over-elaborating and telling elements of the story that aren't kind of necessary. You, know, you have to trim the fat as well. So it's, it's that's the task of it all. You, know, you accumulate as much um as much material as you can and you've got to sort it into an order that makes sense and then you've got to kind of trim it and make it entertaining so that's kind of that how i approach it are you writing another book at the moment uh n- not really i have a couple of kind of ideas in a very nebulous stage so nothing i could really go into because they might not uh, ever see the light of day at this point but i do hope to do to do more for sure in, in the near future um and uh, ronnie it's been fan, fan, uh, fascinating speaking to you do you have a website where people can go to to buy your books is it amazon is it anywhere else where should they yeah go? it's all on amazon if you search my name on amazon you'll see my books i've got four uh, out at the moment um yeah and you can find me on the usual social media places uh you can find my work um if you search my name uh, online I, I, I do a lot of work for the guardian do a lot of features for the guardian at the moment um you can find they're all on my author page there it's all, all laid out Awesome, Ryan. Thank you very much for your time this evening and for being an unsung hero of sport. My pleasure. Cheers, Mark. Thank you.